Church Live. I hope you have come ready to praise, to worship, and hear a word from the Lord today. So gather the family and come on in for a wonderful time in His presence.
Did you enjoy that time of praise and worship in the presence of our Lord? I pray that you did. Now I'm here to let you know of some things that are happening at Jubilee City Church. All the King's men, you are invited to call in on Saturday mornings via Ring Central from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. for a time of intercessory prayer and dialogue. Nothing better than men coming together to pray and talk things out. Now on Thursdays at 7 p.m. on Facebook, our apostle goes live with Understanding the Times. He's been covering Family Matters, the Marriage Edition. I hope you've enjoyed that. Tune in 7 p.m. on Thursdays and see what he's talking about this Thursday. I promise you will not regret it. Now, October 11th, mark your calendars. If you came out to the Family Fall Fest and had a great time, guess what? We get to do it again, October 11th, 10 a.m. at the Victory Ranch. We are going to have our Family Fall Fest too, a continuation of fun and fellowship. We will have the horseback riding again. We will have lots of games and, and fun for the kids to enjoy. So come on out. Remember, you are dressing casually. We're going to praise the Lord, worship the Lord. We're going to hear a word from God and have fun together. Food and fellowship. Please, if you've missed any of these announcements or you just want to stay in tune and stay in touch to what we're doing, go and check out our new and improved webpage, our website, jubileecity.org. We have all the information that you need there of what is going on at our church. Now, if God is moving on your heart to give to Jubilee City, your tithes and your offerings, there are several ways that you can do so. Tithely, through the Tithely app, the cash app or pay simple we urge you to give to God's house so that we can continue doing the work of the Lord now at this time we're going to turn our attention our hearts and our minds and get ready for the word of the Lord from our very own Apostle Ellis L. Smith thank you Carmen for those informative announcements I pray that you all enjoyed that wonderful time of praise and worship. I pray that uh, you were receiving those announcements, and I pray that you participated in our time of giving of our tithes and offerings and gifts of love. We strongly encourage you to give, and as you're giving, I want to speak the word of God over you. As you give in faith, as you give, not giving to get, but give knowing that God always, always responds to people that give to him as an act of worship. Let me pray over you. Father, I speak your word over your people as they've given their tithes and offerings and gifts of love. I declare and decree the goodness of God, the favor of God, and the blessing of your kingdom over every household, every family, every individual. And I release the power of Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, where your word says, My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And for this, we are so thankful. In his name we pray. Amen and amen. As you all know, I've been teaching this series entitled God and Government. And we've been going to some pretty deep places. And some of the things I know that we've been sharing have kind of gone against the grain, depending on how you think and what your perspective is as it relates to God and government, as it relates to politics and how Christians should be thinking as it relates to that. So I'm going to go a little deeper tonight, and I still may ruffle some feathers, but I pray that you are a truth seeker, and I pray that your spirit is so open to the Holy Spirit to bring understanding, life, and truth, because after all, Jesus called him the spirit of truth. Let me pray over the word of the Lord before we go and share this message. 
Father, we're so grateful for this time you've given us to minister your word to this, your great people, and they are indeed a great people. Anoint your men, servant, even now, to speak as of the oracles of God. I rebuke the spirit of error, and I release the spirit of truth and of revelation and accuracy. I pray there's a fresh anointing to minister and a fresh anointing to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. We've been teaching this subject on God and government, and to be exact, this is part four of this series that we've been sharing. And last week we left off out of Joshua chapter 5, uh, verses 13 through 15. I'm not going to go back and read that per se. Just kind of want to give you an overview of that because it was right before the Battle of Jericho. And Joshua uh, had gone to pray, and he, was, and he saw a man standing there with a sword drawn. And he was curious about who this person was. And he actually said, are you for us or for our adversaries? And the response was neither. In other words, he's really saying, I'm not on the right or the left. I'm not on anybody's side, but for the sake of the captain of the Lord of hosts. Whenever you see in the scripture the term Lord of hosts, it always denotes the Lord of war. After all, Joshua saw him with his sword drawn. I believe that was an Old Testament appearance of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, what we would call the pre-incarnate Christ. And it's important to understand that dynamic because he's making it clear, I'm not on anybody's side, but the Lord of hosts. I am the Lord of hosts. So we had to make sure as believers in this present political conflict our nation is in, in the infighting that goes on politically that has crept over into the church, so we've got Christians at odds with each other based upon political parties. Whenever we do that, we become children of a lesser God. Why? Our allegiance is to the kingdom of God. And God's kingdom is superior to every other kingdom. That's why God told Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1, This day I have set you over the kingdoms and the nations. Why? He told him to tear down, to pull down, to throw down, to uproot. Then he said to build and to plant. So when we understand that dynamic, uh, we are representing a higher order, a supreme order, the kingdom of God. And his kingdom rules over all. And just like he told Jeremiah, I'm setting you over these other inferior kingdoms, uh, the same is true for God's people today. So we must not think like Republicans or Democrats. We think like kingdom citizens of, because our citizenship, the Bible tells us, is in heaven. So today, I want to go a little deeper. Well, last week we gave you the party platforms. We didn't tell you which party to go with. We didn't tell you how to vote. That is not our posture. That is not our mindset to dictate to people what, who to vote for. Our role is to give you the biblical perspective, to give you understanding as to who stands for this. Well, what do you believe about that from a biblical perspective? Who stands for that? What you believe about that from a biblical perspective, and then you come to a conclusion as to how you're going to vote based upon your conviction. The problem is that many of God's people have preferences and not a conviction based on the word of God. We'll talk more about conviction versus preference later on in this series because that is going to be a whammy. Most of the people who call themselves Christians, um, they are not doing it out of a deep conviction. Because that dictates everything you believe. That dictates everything you embrace. That dictates your worldview. And this election we're coming into in less than 30 days, this election is probably the most divisive election in American history. The two parties, the two primary parties in our nation, they're further apart right now than perhaps they've ever been in American history. Where is the church in all of this? Where is God in all of this? Where should the kingdom posturing be in this context? One of the ways to understand that is looking at Romans chapter 13. So I want to look at that. I want to read out of the, the New King James Version. And Romans chapter 13 is often misunderstood uh, primarily because it's often taught from a political perspective and not a biblical perspective. So as we go through this, uh, we're going to give you some definite points to help you think biblically and not politically. Why? Your biblical perspective dictates 
to your political perspective. Let me say that one more time. Your biblical perspective will dictate, direct, navigate your political perspective. If you don't have a good, solid biblical perspective, then you are subject to the whims of the culture, the predominant voices that you hear, and it will cause you to follow a certain narrative. And trust me, there are many narratives out there. So let's look at this from a biblical, ideological perspective. Starting in Romans 13, verse 1, the New King James Version. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. That's a pretty weighty term in the Greek, governing authorities. The Greek word there for governing is hyper-echo, hyper-echo. It means to stand out. It means to rise above. It means to be supreme. It means to be superior in rank, authority, and power. It means uh, the prominent men or rulers. So there are those that have a higher rank in the context of government, in the context of political infrastructure, they have more authority than others. So when you understand that dynamic, what that really means is uh, their people, by virtue of their political posturing, uh, have a higher role where they control, direct, dictate, form policy. And this, according to this, this definition, is supreme. We have a Supreme Court in our country. How does one become a Supreme Court Justice? They're appointed by some of a higher dimension from the executive branch, who we call the President. So the President of the United States of America actually will nominate a Supreme Court Justice. That's the way it happens in our country. So looking at that as how it works in America, and looking at the biblical perspective, not the political one, the biblical one, we have to follow the narrative based upon Romans chapter 13. Now, why is this so important? The book of Romans is the most doctrinal book in your Bible. The book of Romans is a doctrinal masterpiece. The book of Romans speaks in so many dimensions. And here in chapter 13, it's addressing how the church God's people, the called out ones, uh, should be postured uh, as it relates to how we see government, how we see the governing authorities. Now, I just d define that word governing from the Greek. The Greek word there for authority or authorities in the plural means delegated authority. So this person doesn't have it on their own. It means to be endued with strength and power. Once again, there's an endowment that comes from the outside that gives this person the empowerment to function in that role as a political leader. It means the ability to influence. Now that is right out of the Greek. The ability to influence. So those that function at high level, whether it be in the executive branch, the judicial branch, or the legislative branch, the way it operates here in America, we've always looked at things from a political perspective. Now we're shifting our thinking to a biblical one. Now what does that mean? Well, let's keep on reading here. It goes on to say, we're reading in the next verse here, for there is no authority except from God. So biblically, not politically, Everyone in political office, uh, they get their authority from God. Whether it's executive branch, whether it's a judicial branch, whether it's legislative branch, uh, all of the branches get their authority from God. It says here, there is no authority. In other words, any other authority is illegitimate. There is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Oh no, we, they're elected. That's what you thought. God lets us go through our electoral process and do our, you know, our due diligence, and I'm not saying don't vote. I'm not minimizing that. But ultimately, God does what he wants to do with any nation. Why? Because he's God and he calls all the shots. And there are certain times uh, when we think a certain party is going to win or a certain, should I say, uh, political leader or candidate is going to win, uh, and God would just shift things. Uh, there are certain elections uh, that people are still scratching their head. How did he win that? How did she lose that? How did this person get elected? Because God not only would interfere, intervene, interject himself in man's political dealings. Get this. Some people won't even be elected. They will be selected 
by God because God doesn't operate under a democracy. He operates in a, dem in a theocracy. So that's why Dan the book of Daniel chapter 2 makes it real clear. God puts one in office and takes another one out based upon his sovereignty. Now, I defined for you last week God's sovereignty and God's providence. All that is at play here. Why? Because it says there is no authority except by God. Well, how does God do that? Based upon his sovereignty and his providence. We defined that for you last week. So now we're looking at this not politically. We're looking at this biblically. Let's go a little deeper see what I'm talking about. Once again, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. So when you resist government, when you resist God-ordained authority, then you are, in essence, resisting God. That's what this is saying. And those who resist, it goes on to say at the end of verse 2, will bring judgment on themselves. Why? For rulers are not a terror to good works. In other words, if I'm doing what's right, if I'm obeying the law, if I'm obeying God's law, then what's the problem? Rulers are not a terror to good works. But what? But to evil. If I'm going to intentionally break the law, what makes a nation work is laws. I know you don't like that. People don't like it. I don't like law. Well, law is what governs everything. Law brings order. You ever heard the term law and order? Okay? So where there is no law, there is disorder. And everybody does what's right in his own eyes. People make up their own rules, decide what they want to do. So God is a God of law. When you violate that law, it has serious consequences. We live in a, in a world that's under the law of gravity. And under the law of gravity, if you violate that law, you will have very serious consequences like loss of life. This is very serious. So God has laws concerning marriage concerning how you to live your life, concerning what the value of life. Thou shalt not kill or shed innocent blood. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's goods. There are all kinds of laws God put in place that control and conduct culture and society. When those laws are violated, when those laws are broken, there are serious consequences. You know, there's much talk in our present-day political culture about making America great again. What does that really mean? If you mean make America great again, then we go back to Jim Crow laws and redlining and marginalizing people and discrediting people for their work, then there's a problem with that. But I grew up in an America that I wouldn't mind having that America back again. I grew up as a kid in the 1950s and 1960s. I grew up in neighborhoods where people left their doors open. I grew up in the area of Linwood and Vicksburg, and people were able to leave their uh, doors open at night. Back then, uh, neighbors uh, would look out for other children. If I did anything wrong on my block, uh, if I broke a window, which I did a couple times, um, if I violated any neighborhood rules, uh, if I got into a fight, um, Mrs. Armstrong down the street would deal with me, spank my behind, Take me to my mother, let her know what she did, and my mother will spank my behind again. Today, try that. Why? We're not great like that anymore. So if you mean make America great again with our neighborhoods, communities like that, where children were obedient, children followed the rules, children did not pull out guns to shoot somebody because they got mad at them. That was unheard of when I was growing up. So when I say make America great again, that's what I'm talking about. Communities that were safe. Communities where children were not subject to predators the way they are right now. Communities where people loved each other, served each other. When they went shopping, if, I, if my household ran out of butter, I knew someone in our neighborhood would make sure my mother had butter or milk or sugar, any staples. Everybody had enough. We were a community. A common unity existed. We stayed out and played until the street lights went off. We could hang out till then. And when the street lights go, well, or should I say, well, went off when they came on. When the street lights came on, I had to come in. Oftentimes it was, it was already dark. My whole point now, it was a different America. It was a different community. We're not there anymore. 
So when you ever hear me say anything about make America great again, that's the America I'm talking about, where people served each other. People loved each other. People weren't mad and angry and bitter. People were all, all in the streets using profanity. I would love to see that kind of culture where people had compassion, sensitivity, serving. They would speak to each other walking down the street. They would, neighbors actually talk to each other. They weren't afraid of each other. So now we're in a different kind of a culture. So laws have been broken. And because laws are broken, uh, you have to lock your doors. Because laws are broken, some of you have bars over your windows. Because laws are broken, we have alarm systems. Why? Because there, there's that criminal element out there. It's called the mystery of iniquity or the mystery of lawlessness. The spirit of lawlessness. So the church has got to raise up a standard uh, to combat this. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment here. So going back to this passage... For rulers are not a chair to good works, but to, to evil. Do, what, do you want to be afraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have the praise from the same. For he is God's minister. So this is saying our governmental officials, our governmental authorities are God's minister. In other words, a minister is servant. Actually, this word minister in the Greek is diakonos. Now, diakonos has many meanings depending on the context, okay? It has a very broad meaning, and sometimes we start using Greek words. Uh, you got to know what does that word mean. You can get the, the etymological meaning of the word and what it really meant by definition, but what did it mean in certain cultures and societies uh, in the days of the Bible? So I'm going to give you the definition in the context uh, of what this passage is talking about because it's the same word used for deacon in the church. But this word says uh, that your governmental officials, your president, your governor, your mayors, uh, they, are, they are not servants of the people. Don't forget, we're not talking political. I told you I'd make that distinguish for you, that distinction for you. We're not talking about political. We're talking about, biblically speaking, uh, our president uh, is God's minister. Biblically speaking, our governor is God's minister. Biblically speaking, the, the mayors of our respective cities or communities, they're God's ministers. This is how God wants us to see it. Not politically, but biblically. Hear this. Almost no one you know thinks like that. That's why we're in the mess we're in. Why? Because no one thinks biblically when it comes to politics. We think left, we think right. We follow donkeys and elephants, and nobody follows the lamb. And when you understand what that means, uh, there's something that happens in your heart on how you see everything uh, politically. You go to a higher place, and you see it through the lenses of biblical insight understanding. That's what I'm giving you right now. Now, you can say, well, I don't believe that. Truth does not need your endorsement. The Bible wasn't written for you to agree with it. The Bible was written for you to obey it as a Christian. And few people even understand it to the degree they can obey it. Therefore, we walk in a lack of understanding. We walk in lack of knowledge. And according to Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, our Bible tells us, God says, my people are destroyed. Why? Because of a lack of knowledge. My God. Going back to this path, to this definition, this word diakonos. In this context, he says he's God's minister or God's diakonos. It means one who executes the commands of another. So those in political office execute not what the people want. We have this culture that says give the people what they want. In God's economy, he carries out the commands of God. Wow. This word also means, this out of the Greek, and I'm not making this up. The servant of a king. Well, who is the king? Well, Jesus is the king of kings. So our elected officials are the servants of the king, not the people. You thought it was the people. Politically, you're right. Biblically, you're wrong. I'm giving you the distinction here. It also means um, one who cares, watch this, for the poor and distributes resources uh, for the benefit of the poor. God always has this thing. When he spoke to nations throughout the entire Old Testament, he always admonished them concerning the poor, the fatherless, and the widows. He admonished them that. The poor, 
the fatherless, and the widows. So the church has got to do that. Here's how this works. It's not the job of the government. It's the job of the church. It's not the mandate of the government. It's the mandate of the church. So what does that really, really mean? The government gets its direction on how to properly relate to the poor from the God's people. I'm going to prove that for you biblically in a little while here. In other words, uh, those in political office must have an ear to hear what the prophet is saying. Those in governmental office must have an ear to hear what the apostle is saying. If they shut that down, uh, the people will mourn. Why? Because the righteous is not ruling. And the scripture is real clear. When the righteous rule, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the wicked knows anybody that won't hear the voice of God's oracle gifts. They shut down the White House. They shut down the governor's mansion. They shut down uh, all of the political uh, um, platforms uh, that should be hearing what God wants for the people, but they make up their own rules along the way. And as a result, it causes uh, the wicked to rule and the nation will mourn. My God. So, once again, I'll, I'll make sure you understand this. This word means in the Greek. Diakonos, in this context, one who executes the commands of another, the servant of a king, one who cares for the poor and distributes resources for the benefit of the poor. So going back to this passage now, for he is God's minister, for you, for good, but if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. So he has to carry out enforcement of law. He has to make sure the lawbreakers are dealt with properly. So, once again, he carry, doesn't carry the sword in vain. Why? For he is God's minister. He says it again. Whenever God says the same thing over and over again, you best be getting it. He is God's minister. Then he says why? An avenger... To execute, wow, that's capital punish, punishment, folks. To execute wrath on him who what? Who practices evil. I don't mean just make a mistake, but has a lifestyle of evil. Now, this word here, avenger, in the Greek, is the Greek word ekdikos. Ekdikos. It means to carry out. It means justice to the punisher. It, or, or as a punisher, rather, it means to exact a penalty. Let me define that again. This word in the Greek, ekdikos, means uh, to carry out justice uh, as a punisher. It means to exact a penalty. So that's what the government does uh, to those who break the law. Now, there's a lot more I can say about that, but i got to keep my focus where this needs to go. It goes on to say, in verse 5, Therefore... You must be subject, not only because of wrath, in other words, uh, you'll get the, 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 the brunt of God's wrath, but also for conscious sake. The word conscious here in the Greek is the word sunodesis. It means uh, that portion of the soul. And don't forget now, verse 1 opens up by talking about the soul. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Now in verse 6 he talks about, or verse 5 rather, he talks about this whole idea of conscious sake. And the word sunodesis, uh, it means the portion of the soul that distinguishes between what is morally good or morally bad. It's the inner prompting uh, to pursue one and to shun the other. The word conscious also denotes uh, the moral neutrality. Now, what does that mean? Well, your conscience is morally neutral based upon what you feed it. So if you don't give it distinction as to what is right, what is wrong, then your conscience would just do any old thing that your flesh will dictate to it. And trust me, your flesh is always dictating to your soul. Your flesh always wants your soul to go the way of badness, wrongness, evil, unrighteousness, wickedness. And you say, well, how do you know that? I don't know, Romans chapter 7, don't forget this doctrinal masterpiece we spoke of earlier. In Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul states, uh, we know that in our flesh there dwells no good thing. Now, how does that relate to your conscience? Don't forget, your conscience is morally neutral. It doesn't go good or bad. It, it goes by the compass uh, of what you dictate through it, uh, by your mind being renewed, what you tell it, this is right and this is wrong. So... 
if you have a nation of people, if you have even those who are in governing authority who decide based upon their conscience and they haven't based it on the word of God, their minds have not been renewed and they decide what's right that violates God's word. Now we're getting to some real raw rubber meets the road stuff. There could be times when the governing authorities that we're told to obey. See, we have to embrace the whole counsel of God. Not just take certain scriptures out of context and make them say something. You can make the Bible say almost anything you want it to say. We have to follow what is referred to in the book of Acts chapter 20, the whole counsel of God. So when you understand the whole counsel of God, there are times when laws are made that are not congruent with and consistent with God's law. And when that happens, the church must rise up with a prophetic voice and speak into it. Now, there are those who say people like me, being up an apostle, uh, we should not be involved in politics. Uh, we shouldn't be talking about political issues. Uh, the whole Bible addresses political issues. Why? Politics dictate morality. What does that mean? Well, if you have a certain political leader in office, uh, and that political leader says, uh, I embrace the ideology and concept of people being free to marry whoever they want to marry. That is moral. That says basically... It's okay if a man feels like uh, he wants to marry another man, or if a man feels like uh, he wants to change his gender, he's no longer a man from now on. I'm no longer John. I'm now Jane. I've changed my name. I've, I've, I've been a woman trapped in a man's body all these years. Uh, now I'm coming out. So if you have political leaders that embrace that ideology, they're in violation of God's law. So when man's law, like we have in America right now, violates God's law, then the Bible is real clear in Acts chapter 5, we ought to obey God and not man. So that means we follow the higher law. Once again, God said, I've set you over kingdoms and nations. So we're over the ideology that runs America because America operates by a democracy. God operates by a theocracy, which denotes God rules. God rules based upon God's law. God has set his law, and he mandates us to live our lives accordingly. That's why in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, God told Jeremiah, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. Why? Watch this. That you may observe to do all that is written therein. Then he says, then you'll make your way prosperous, then you'll have good success. Meaning God has laws that he wants you and me to live by. When we violate their, those laws, there are serious consequences. When we make up our own laws, whether it be from our government, whether it's executive branch, whether it's judicial branch, whether it's on, on the legislative order, wherever we have policy, laws, executive orders that violate what God makes real clear in his word, his law, his commandments, his mandates as to how he wants his creation to live. Now, what does that mean? I know you have your own way of thinking. You have your own rights. You have your own perspective about things. Uh, and there are certain things that get you hot and bothered, certain things get you mad. Uh, well, the kind of things that get you all hot and bothered and mad aren't the same things that get God hot and bothered and mad. Oh, there is the wrath of God. He can get ticked off. I can show you in the scriptures where God got ticked off uh, and there were serious consequences. But God has dictated how he wants you to think. God has dictated, based on his law, how he wants you to live. God even tells you, think on these things. Well, I don't want to be brainwashed. Hear this. Something or someone is brainwashing you, whether you believe it or not, is irrelevant. It's happening all the time. Now, more than ever, because of technology, we live in this information age, you're being inundated with all kinds of ideologies, concepts, ways of thinking, perspectives, worldviews, feelings, uh, all kinds of things are bombarding you every single day, all day long. And unless your mind is renewed to the Word of God, you will easily begin to think a certain way that doesn't line up with the word of God. In the context of this passage, Romans chapter 13, most of God's people think about it politically and not biblically. I just gave you the biblical perspective, not the political one. So now this changes everything. 
Now, what does that mean? Well, in America, we're on a trajectory of a godless society. We're going in a certain direction where there's, I shared with you last week, the devolution of, of our nation. We're going in a direction that can be very harmful to us uh, and can damage us uh, irreparably, irreparably unless we make some major changes uh, and we make them quick. Now, I heard a man of God say recently that, hear this, Christianity can survive without America, but America cannot survive without Christianity. My God, my God. So we have to look at what has happened in other nations historically, because we, you can actually get political leaders, elected officials uh, who duly ran and went through the whole process and became the authority, what the Romans 13 called the governing authorities in their nation. But if they have an agenda that violates God's authority and they can get God's people to buy into that agenda, the nation will go downhill. You do realize that's what happened under the Adolf Hitler regime. There was a strong appeal to the Lutherans to let Adolf Hitler do what he wants to do. Because the dominant religion at that time in Germany was Lutheran. And uh, they were told to shut up uh, because he's a duly elected official. And they used Romans chapter 13 to get God's people, the Christians, the believers, not to say anything. To let him do what he needs to do because of the economy. And he to cleanse the culture. And he wiped out millions of Jews. Understand that is evil. That is wicked. But he was in authority. I mean, so why would God let his man, his authority, because you just got them telling us that it's God's man for authority. It's God's servant. It's God's diakonos. And why would God allow that? God allows these things, not just in Germany during the Adolf Hitler era. He allows it in any nation, including America, as a wake-up call. It gets back to 2 Chronicles 7.14. It becomes a wake-up call. It gets down to Isaiah chapter 61, or 62 rather. Arise and shine. It's time for the church to arise. It's time for the church to awaken. It's time for the church to pray and to seek God. And sometimes we get lackadaisical, disengaged. The scripture says, Woe unto them who are at ease in Zion. And too many of God's people have come to a place of being at ease in Zion. When things are wrong, when things are right, we are to call them out. So God will let things go in a certain direction and use it as a sound the alarm among God's people. He'll let things get so bad where all of a sudden we realize this isn't God. It shouldn't have to be that way, but it is what it is. So now there's a prophetic clarion call for the church to wake up, to arise, but arise to what? There's this whole thing about being woke. Everybody want to be woke. And there's a whole ideology out there called the woke church. Unless they're awakening to a biblical perspective, unless they're awakening to a kingdom worldview, unless they're awakening to biblical truth, I don't want them to wake up. Y'all go back to sleep. Go back to whatever you were doing before. If you're going to wake, awaken to righteousness. Don't awake to socialism. Don't awake to communism. Don't awake to uh, postmodernism. Don't awake to modernism. Awake to righteousness according to the scripture. Once we get this aligned with biblical ideology, we can get this thing turned around pretty quick. The problem is uh, God's people just aren't getting it. What I just explained to you is not commonly taught on Romans chapter 13. I gave you truth. I broke it down in the Greek. I gave you an exegesis, what it's really talking about, and how this portion of the passage ends uh, concerning your sunodesis, your consciousness. And it's based upon what you feed it. That's why people can do things that are just crazy. You've heard the term, well, you know, he has no conscience, or she has no conscience. They can just do anything, and it doesn't seem like it's anything wrong. Why? Because the conscience is morally neutral. This says, uh, for conscience sake, let's deal with this. For conscience sake, let's look at this a little deeper. So, what does that really mean in the New Testament context? Can you go deeper with me? I want to look, if you will, another passage. First Peter chapter 2 starting in verse 13. First Peter, chapter 2, and I want to start reading in verse 13. 
And I want to switch. I'm going to read this passage out of the, uh, the Amplified Classic Edition. And I want to start reading, once again, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. I want to read verses 13 through 18. Listen to this. Be submissive to every human institution. That goes back to Romans 13, the governing authorities. This context is the human institution, which means our governing. And authority, why? For the sake of the Lord. Why? Don't forget we just already established them. They're God's ministers. The president is God's minister. No matter who, who, that, who that is, uh, it's God's minister. The governor is God's minister. The mayor of our respective cities, it's God's minister. So he says here, once again, be submissive to every human institution and authority. Why? For the sake of the Lord. Whether it be of the emperor as supreme or to governors um, as sent by him to bring vengeance, punishment, justice. To who? To those who do wrong. And to encourage those who do good service. Why? Verse 15. For it's God's will and intention that by doing right, your good and honest lives should silence, wow, muzzle, gag, the ignorant charges and ill-informed criticisms of foolish persons. So there are people, the more you want to do things God's way, the more you want to make a standard for righteousness, biblical ideology, biblical government, biblical politics, and speak God's word into every sphere of culture and society, there will be people who aren't going to like it. There will be people who are going to criticize you. Why? You don't follow their narrative. What you're doing, how you think of what you stand for doesn't fit their paradigm. So you become the brunt of their hostility. You become the object of their hatred. You be why you, they are threatened by the standard that you set. So if you are, if you made a real strong stance concerning, let's just speak on something like abortion. They said, why are you got to bring that up? That is major with God. That's just one issue. Hey. Life is an issue all by itself. Hey, if no one ever gets to be born, they are never victimized by racism. Hey, you have to be born to be a victim of redlining. You have to have a life to, to not to get a job you applied for if you never get to be born. So now we have governmental officials that embrace, hear this, birthday abortions. In other words, the child can be murdered after they're born, if the abortion doesn't take properly. Are you kidding me? Some of y'all vote for people like that. I ain't naming no names. Some of y'all will go out on November the 2nd and put that little mark behind somebody that support killing babies the day they're born. You going to tell me you're good with that? No, 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 no. You're going to, before God, tell God, God, I voted for someone on purpose knowing they support killing babies that you put on earth the day they're born, birthday abortion. God, I'm down with that. If you're okay with that, then go ahead on with your bad self. You cannot say, no one told me. You cannot say, no one gave me truth because today I'm giving you truth. Well, how do we know that's a lie? Because God says so. God actually says in Psalm 139, I knew you in your mother's womb, and you were fearfully and wonderfully made. He says something similar in Jeremiah chapter 1. Not only that, God says everybody, everybody who's ever been born, God chose them before the foundation of the world. So you got to make sure you understand the implications of this. So you support that, then you are putting yourself in a very precarious position. Not politically, biblically. And when the government decides that they want to support that, it's our job to call them out. I am not being a true man of God. I am not being God's apostle if I sit back and don't talk about this. Yeah, I'm going to talk. You can turn this off if you want to, but you can never say nobody told you. You can never cop out on ignorance because I'm giving you truth from the word of God. Now, let's look at this a little deeper. My God, my God. Watch this. Live as free people, yet without employing your freedom as a pretext for wickedness. In other words, if you're free because I have, I have choice to do this and choice to do that, don't use that freedom as a platform to do things that violate God's word. That's what it's saying. 
but live at all times as servants of God. Show respect. Show respect for all men. Treat them honorably. We live in a culture, not a culture of honor. We live in a culture of dishonor. We're looking to find things wrong. We're looking to point the finger. Wait a minute. That's what the devil does. Satan is referred to in the Bible as the one who's the accuser of the brethren. The one who's always pointing the finger. One who's always looking to slander, tear down, make someone's character uh, uh, very negative. So... This is saying, don't you do that, okay? Once again, show respect for all men. Treat them honorably, not dishonorably. How do we do that? Love the brotherhood, the Christian fraternity, which Christ is the head. Reverence God. Honor the emperor. Now, you do know who's writing this, right? Peter. You do know what was going on with Peter when he wrote this. Peter was on, under house arrest under Nero. At the time he wrote this, uh, Nero is killing Christians by the thousands. He decided he wanted to watch them burn uh, on the terrace of his palace. Uh, he wanted them to be torches uh, throughout the city. So he commanded his soldiers to go out there, arrest Christians, uh, tie them to stakes, uh, and burn them alive. And he wanted to look at it. And Peter was lined up to be executed by Nero. And Peter writes, honor him. What? Peter, he's about to kill you. Honor him. Peter, he hates Christians. Honor him. Doesn't mean agree with him. Doesn't mean support his platform, support his policies. Uh, but we don't know what it means to honor those who are in authority even when we disrespect or uh, 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 don't agree with them. We have this culture of dishonor and when you understand that dishonor, you don't really know what, the, what the honor really, really means. To reverence, to speak of uh, in a godly way, even when you disagree with them. They're political leaders I disagree with, but I will never tear them down. I will never speak words against them. I will check their policies. I'll make real clear, the Bible says this, and you stand for that, and here's why I stand concerning that. But to just blaspheme their name and to speak, I mean, what's going on with Christians and social media and our present, our present president, and what's going on with him physically? He was recently diagnosed with the coronavirus, but after the last 24 hours of, 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 of when I first taped this. Here's the point I want to make with you. Christians are going off on social media. He deserved that and calling him names. No child of God should be operating that. The Bible commands you, mandates you to pray for those who are in authority. Not tear them down, not speak against them. I don't care what your political persuasion is. I don't care if you hate their policies or don't dis or dislike the person what they do. That is irrelevant. You have a biblical mandate. Either you want to be Christians or not, you choose. You want to be really followers of the word of God uh, or go do something else. Now, if you don't want to do what the Bible says, go do something else with your life religiously. You can be a Buddhist. You can be a Hare Krishna. You can be a Muslim. But if you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you must adhere to his word. Uh, otherwise, you don't fit into the kingdom paradigm. Now we can see why the nation's in such big trouble. Because God's people are not following the kingdom paradigm. Back to this passage, once again. Show respect to all men. Treat them honorably. Love the brotherhood, the Christian fraternity, which Christ is the head. Reverence God. Honor the emperor. So we've got to make sure we understand what that really, really means. Our nation has gone on a trajectory that's turned against God, turned against God's ways, uh, and we live in a culture that we just dishonor people, and we're becoming more and more godless. Jeremiah chapter 2, I'm not going to turn there, I'm just going to reference it, but Jeremiah chapter 2 uh, talks, uh, God asks a question, and the question is, uh, has a nation changed God's? And then God says, you have changed God's and gone after idols. You'll follow the ideologies, concepts, ways of thinking my people have, and you've literally changed God's. Then he says, be astonished, O heavens. Be in amazement, O stars, that my people have done what? 
they changed gods. Who ever heard of a nation changing who their God is? That's your trajectory that America is on, and that's your trajectory that Israel was on in Jeremiah chapter 2. Now, we've somehow gotten bought into this ideology of separation of church and state which came, comes from a lack of understanding of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, which states, Congress shall make no law respecting one establishment of religion or prohibiting the free ex ex exercise thereof. And when you understand that dynamic, it doesn't mean that the, 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 the government dictates to the church. What it means, the, the government can't make any laws that tell the church what we should believe, what we should preach. Our founding fathers, uh, the framers of our Constitution, the initial founding fathers, because America didn't have one founding father, and they developed an ideological concept uh, that was centered around biblical ideology. Now, how do we know that? I did a little research on this, and it's amazing. Of the 175 founding fathers of our nation, 88 of them were Episcopalian or Anglican. 30 of them were Presbyterian, 27 of them were Congregationalists, 7 of them were Qu Quakers, 6 were Dutch Reformed, 5 were Lutheran, and 3 were Unitarian, 2 were Methodist, and 1 was a Calvinist. This breaks down the religious persuasion, ideology of, of the founding fathers of this nation. So we have to be able to be clear as to what the original intent was. Why? God is into original intent. So he put something in their heart, and there are certain things that are in the founding documents. Not everything is right. Not everything is, is good. Uh, there are flaws there. I don't put the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence on the level of the Bible. The Bible is sacred and holy. I'm not trying to put the Constitution on that level. However, the framers of the Constitution did have biblical concepts, and in certain things, biblically speaking, they violated, like slavery. But let's not get stuck there. Let's begin to look at how God sees it and the redemptive value there. If we don't get past that, we're going to make everything in America centered around racism. You're not going to like this next statement, some of you. Our major issue in America is not racism. Actually, I look for racist settings. I go after them. I sniff them out. And I melt them down. I could tell you story after story after story where I've proven this. I have actually dealt with people that were racist and the love of God, the goodness of God, the majesty of the king uh, melted them down where they were eating out of my hands. Looking for ways to serve Ella Smith. I'm not making this up. This is documented. But if I'm angry, bitter, ball my fists up, want to protest and, and, and fight for my rights, I don't have to fight for any rights. I've been given the privilege of the kingdom. I don't look for any system to give me my rights. I'm above them. Don't forget God told Jeremiah this day. I have set you over kingdoms and nations. So how should the church be postured? My time is running out. I'm going to make sure I hit this point, and we're going to wind this up, okay? I want to look at Daniel, my God, my God, chapter 9. And I'm not going to teach this in detail. I'm going to pick up on this next week. What I want to do right now is read this for you, and I want you to pick up on how the church should be postured now. How should, in light of where our country is politically, racially, culturally, religiously, how should God's people be postured, my God? I'm reading this once again out of the Amplified uh, Translation, starting in verse 3. Here's how we should be postured. Here's how you should be thinking. Daniel said, And I set my face to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplications and fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Then what Daniel and I prayed to the Lord my God, and I made confession and said, O oh Lord, great and dreadful God, who keeps covenant, mercy and loving kindness uh, with those who love him and keep his commandments. Not recommendations, not suggestions, commandments. 
Verse 5, we have sinned and dealt perversely and done wickedly and have rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and your ordinances. Neither have we listened to and heeded your servants, the prophets. Why? Who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. Now we're going back to Romans chapter 13 and 1 Peter chapter 2. The governing authorities. The biblical context, biblical framework is of God's oracle gifts. Speak to those in governmental authority. That's what this verse is saying. Well, unless we have people in political office... They will hear, here's how God wants government to run. Here's how the democracy comes under the auspices of the theocracy. People say, well, that, that won't work. It won't work if you have godless people who resist godly authority. Now, here's what he goes on to say. Oh, this is so powerful. Oh, Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us confusion and shame of face. Welcome to America. As of this day, to the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all of Israel, to those who are near and those who are far off, through all the countries to which you have driven them because of the treacherous trespass which we have committed against you with violating God's commandments, violating God's law. O oh Lord, to us belong confusion and shame, to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord God belong mercy, loving kindness, and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. And we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us through his servants to prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law, even turning aside that we may not obey your voice. Therefore, the curse has been poured out on us. Hello, pandemics. On us and the oath which is written in the law of Moses, of the servant of God. Why? Because we have sinned against him. And he has carried out intact his threatening words, which he threatened against us and against our judges, our kings, our princes, our rulers generally, who ruled us. And he has brought upon us a great evil. For under the whole heavens there has not been done anything so dreadful as he has caused to be to be done against Jerusalem. Just as it's written in the law of Moses, as it is with this evil, that would surely come upon the transgressors, so it has come upon us. Yet, we have not earnestly begged for forgiveness and entreated the favor of our Lord God that we might turn from our iniquities. Sounds like Second Chronicles 7, 14, doesn't it? And have understanding and become wise in your truth. God wants to bring us into truth. Why? Jesus put it this way. You shall know the truth, and the truth that you know will make you free. As I close, therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity, the evil, and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is uncompromisingly righteous and rigidly just in all his works, which he does, keeping his word. And we have not obeyed his voice. This should be the response. My time is up. I've gone over time. I want to pray over you right now. I want to speak God's word over you right now as you're in the valid decision as to which way you're going to go in this election. We're not telling you who to vote for, Republican or Democrat. We're giving you biblical conviction. And based upon that, you make a decision. So right now, I want to pray for those who are not born again. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, Master, and Savior, today is your day. Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross just for me. And right now, with great boldness and confidence, I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord, as my Master, as my Savior. Come into my heart. Make me brand new. I renounce the devil and the world. And from this moment forward, I live for Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen. If you believe that prayer, right now you're a new creature in Christ Jesus.
I want to thank you all for joining us in this wonderful time of praise and worship and ministry of the word. I pray your life was encouraged and strengthened. And please know that you are loved, you're cared for, you're prayed for. We'll see you next time. God bless. You're the breath in my soul, life in my bones.